Okay, this is the pre-class video for RPH 140 World Philosophies, class number 22. It's the final class for the semester, <laughs> the summer school session. Um, so I assigned, or we are going to cover three different articles. They're by physicists, mathematicians, people who study the universe and the principles underlying the universe. And I hope the students by now could figure out why I assigned that. But I'm gonna start this video by going all the way back to the beginning of the class and explaining why I organized it the way I organized it. And then we'll culminate in these particular articles showing how they tie it all together. Um, the first sort of obvious thing or what might not be obvious, but I wanna point out is that I did say in Indonesia, they have that multi-faith constitution. So they believe in God but it's a God that includes Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Protestant Christianity, and Catholic Christianity. And the students by now could know that they could take Aristotle's virtues and they could link them at that level in terms of culture and how the political system should work. You should rule for the sake of the ruled. You should do use whatever authority you have in whatever discipline or profession, political, personal, economic, as a parent, whatever, to rule for the benefit of the ruled and to promote a middle class. So those are all the things within culture. And the emphasis so far has been within culture, but Buddha, Hindu, Christian and Islam and Confucian, they all had a view of the nature of reality. So Aristotle did have a view of God, but the readings for today give you phys physicists and mathematicians who, whose view of the universe is compatible with this same idea of God. And Janet Levin calls herself an atheist, but she does her, her view of the universe is compatible with the same kind of belief in God that John Pokinghorn, Freeman Dyson, and Einstein had. So all the other writers look at the universe the same, very similar, same basic orientation, but some of them say that leaves open the possibility for God or um, uh, Let's see, Paul Davies really does believe in God. And then Janet Levin says she's an atheist. So to me, these are, it, the reason they say yes or no has a lot to do with what they think the word refers to. And they don't seem to be educated in Buddhism or Hinduism. They really seem to think that the only options are a personal God that created the universe and either let it go, they would say that that, that God let it go doesn't intervene and change the natural order, right? They would probably all agree on that. They just think that just because there isn't a personal God that comes in there and talks to you or parts the Red Sea, that therefore they don't believe in God. So that's the same as our founding fathers. They had a Newtonian view of God as the great clockmaker that wound things up and let it go. So now in the era of quantum physics, at first Einstein thought that quantum uh, Newtonian mechanic, mechanics, those people point of view, um, thought it threatened whether God exists, but turns out, you know, they just had a, a their view of God was too small. My, there's, there was a book out called Your God is Too Small. <laughs> you just have to expand. So quantum physicists aren't necessarily atheists. They don't think like things are absurd. Einstein thought that. He thought that quantum physics meant God, you know, that 
randomness as at the center of the universe as the primary cause. And he totally disagreed with that. He thought the universe was fundamentally ordered. Now, and the quantum physicists, of course, they always disagree, but plenty of them think the universe is fundamentally ordered. It's called ordered, organized complexity, functionalism. There's just lots of names for this, but um, they just see that underlying order in a different way. And um, yeah, sort of, it depends upon what you mean by order. <laughs> but the very fact that they keep looking for patterns and they keep finding them, like that's evidence to me right there. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> all it means is order is more powerful than disorder. That's all you need in order to have, by nature, we evolved. We were capable of evolving because the universe was understandable. As we evolved, our capacity for pattern recognition was exactly what enabled us to survive and thrive. So we keep trying to find patterns because that is what our, our adaptability and our has been based on. So, and we keep succeeding. So that's great. Um, the, but I mean, there's always that QAnon, you know, they're looking for patterns too. Um, QAnon is driven, I think, by fear and the desire to find some pattern to relieve, alleviate the fear they feel. Or, but it isn't just QAnon. I don't want to just blame them. I did watch a 45-minute video about them, but I hate, I mean, it's not a them, right? There's no one group within QAnon. I'm sure there's hundreds of different reasons people join the club. And if you interview them and ask them, well, what is the foundation? They would totally say completely different things. The only thing they agree on is there's some pattern, right? Conspiracy theory is the claim that there's a pattern there. There's something underlying that. And that's what people are always looking for. So I would want to, to suggest to you that these old patterns, right? The old classical virtues, are based on patterns that the wisdom traditions have noticed for thousands of years. And those are a lot more reliable and they keep reemerging. So even somebody like me, I mean, I can see just in the 50 years I've studied that, oh my gosh, it's variations on a theme, right? So People think everything's changed, but underlying it, I could still teach those, those virtues and students still, the buttons go off. Um, of course, things change. Um, the women are much more um, outspoken and, and um, there's more racial equality. The non-binary um, students, are more respected, acknowledged. So there are definitely changes, but then you go right back to the same patterns, right? They start having the same virtues and vices as everybody else. Um, so let me just explain how I organize the class. And then during the class, I, will, I, I wrote an email saying each of you needs to read two. So you need to respond, have ideas for from two of those articles. And I suggested the uh, poking horn or Einstein rather than Levin. Levin but, you know, if you want to check out the atheist, go ahead. Um, so I have forgotten my own rules and I apologize for that. But First of all, Titus has to remind me to record it. <laughs> and while he's reminding me of that, you can say, but Dr. Beck, you, your idea was that you would write down what the students say and keep your mouth shut until they're done and they talk to each other. 
And then you can say your reactions and then we'll move on to the next article. So that's what I did last semester. And I don't know, somewhere I lost, <laughs> I lost the pattern. I just started interrupting uh, the students or engaging them one-on-one -on -one, and that's what I didn't want to do. So I think all of you know each other pretty well by now and you have you know, developed respect for each other's opinions. So my goal would be, we'll start with like the Einstein and go around the circle. Um, and then I'll take my notes and then I'll respond. And then I'll also make a comment about overall, what do the comments seem to be like? Then um, we'll do that for, for all three articles. And then I'll, um, I'll ask you, what do you anticipate writing your final, right? Your final worldview. What is it that you has really stuck out in your mind that you definitely plan on having in your final paper? Um, and then we'll do another round of that. Um, I have meetings today from three to five, and then I have class and I'm meeting from eight to 10. But um, at 10 o'clock, I can have an office hour or two. I'll just start out with one in case you wanna to talk to me about your final paper. So if you do want to, you can send me an email, say, please be available from 10 or whatever time. I mean, I'm gonna be up till midnight, but again, I probably just have a one hour um, uh, office hour because I am still, buried in papers and grading. But I, I used to require students to come into my office four times a semester and I'd have a nice conversation with all of them. But anyway, and I can even do that online. It's just this summer, I know that you've been so busy. And so I've tried to be available. Most of you haven't taken advantage of that. You probably have to get up and work so you're sleeping. But anyway, um, let me start out with why I organized the class the way I did. Um, let's see, let's do just the general, um, the general, um, what? Characteristics, learning outcomes. Okay, <laughs> oh, it's hard for me to get the lingo, but anyway, hopefully, you think you gained in your ability to read the texts. Um, so now when you read uh, Confucius Analects, they mean a lot more to you, hopefully, than they would have before. You can see how they fit that hierarchy of virtues. You can think about how they played a role in China in the era of the warring states. You also know that our founding fathers liked them and you can figure out why they liked them, right? So if you just think, okay, if I had read the Analects before this class versus now, if I, and then we didn't get very far into the Bhagavad Gita at all, but if someone had talked to me about Hinduism before versus now or Buddhism or whatever. So um, the question would be, did you get better at reading, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know if, if Houston Smith makes more sense now than it would have before. It's a pretty readable book, so you might have been able to just pick it up. But, and the Justice Men, O Women, and then the um, Krista Tippett. So if you can think about, if you just pick those books up at a bookstore or, they came up on Amazon or something, and you had read them before this class, and then um, you read them now, right? Have you learned how to read um, better, more thoughtfully, with more depth, you know, with more questions, with more ability to see the meaning of the text? Um, your papers, okay. Have you learned how to, to develop a clear paper? And again, this is so much more difficult in the summer. Um, communicate your ideas orally. Okay, now this one is something we, we worked on a lot this summer, right? 
there's a lot more of the oral communication and less emphasis on the written. Um, the content of the papers. So are your ideas getting more complex and more creative? I think your ideas in the oral presentation definitely are. And then the, those of you who have been keeping up, um, yes, I mean, I think your, your, your written assignments are getting more complex. Um, are you um, gaining insight or understanding of what it means to link reason and faith, right? Do you understand the value of that? And then of course, the thing I always bring up is do you think you're becoming more intellectually honest? Um, like just being honest about whether you knew much about the founding fathers or not. And then why not? Or whether you knew much about Black Lives Matter, the history of the way African-Americans have been treated in this country. Um, do you know much about Martin Luther King's philosophical foundation and how that continues? Just things like, there's lots of stuff, right? So just being intellectually honest about what you know and don't know. So that many times in life, People are going to be making claims and you can think they, they think they know what they don't know. But, but then the next step is, I want to know this. This is something I need to know, right? So you're not going to just get that desire to know unless you're honest and you admit you don't know. Um, and I think, you know, I, I remember many, many times when I felt that way, which is why I read, you know, a couple thousand pages of stuff since COVID, because finally, you know, I was just sitting, I had more time and I just, there were so many things that I really wanted to know. <laughs> um, commitment to truth. So we've never rejected truth. We've just studied how people thought they had the truth and they did it, but that doesn't mean there's no truth, right? It's true that racism is wrong. So societies that are designed uh, that are structured to be racist are unjust. <laughs> no problem. Same with sexism, um, non-binary sexual orientation, uh, and unlimited destruction of the earth. Fair to opposing points of view, patience with, so hopefully you understand um, there are opposing points of view and then they're completely unreasoned. Uh, assaults, right? Attacks, rhetoric. So it's, it's important to distinguish between an opposing point of view, which is governed by the union of reason and faith or reason and a desire to flourish, a sincere commitment to truth and intellectual honesty versus just attacks, right? Polarization. Um, and then patience with complexity and ambiguity. All right, intercultural knowledge, obviously we've worked on that. Um, and I keep reminding you that you're creating a history now um, and it matters once you get to college and you're aware of that already. I'm just telling you what, what it is that's going on. So you can step back and see, well, yeah, that's part of the system. And that's because I have this capacity in my head to start reflecting and start deliberately creating my own life history and also creating Lyon College's history. Um, integrative learning, I definitely philosophies like that, becoming more reflective and deliberate about how you wanna live, philosophies like that, making more informed decisions, we definitely ethical reasoning, we talked about that, and making more informed choices about what kind of civic engagement. So we talked about nonviolent demonstrations um, and, another, and joining clubs, what it is the fraternity, the Greek system is really about. So my philosophy is to draw you out. You already think about this stuff. So philosophy just helps you think about it more systematically and just you become aware that you are thinking about it in the back of your mind. I had an attendance policy, the school has one, and so a number of students are in trouble for that 
if they have good reasons, we can arrange for incompletes. That's definitely what I would prefer. Um, we have this problem here. Again, I will be lenient. Um, all right. Okay. Papers, posts, plate papers, portfolios. If you think you might want to take more RPH, it'd be great. We have a senior exit interview at the end of the, um, your time here, and it's really fun. And it's uh, a lot more fun if students have kept track of everything they've done honor code and all that other good stuff. Um, so that was that's the basic um, syllabus, but then we had a schedule and the speaking rubric, paper rubric. Um, all right, oh, you could write your final paper on this if you want to. If you think there's this, I don't know, some psychological study or sociological study what your position, not just faith, but flourishing, right? Your idea of the good. Are you a drifter, right? You're disinterested and detached. Um, if you are, a lot of you faked it because everybody seemed pretty engaged. Um, then some, some students might just feel like it was good enough for my parents, my preacher. Um, I don't really want to question what I was raised with. Um, I am asking you in your worldview to show me how your mind has expanded or changed. So you don't have to change your mind, heaven forbid, but you do have to say how you've expanded it. You didn't know that Confucius also had the golden rule. And then you have to say, is it still only true if Jesus says it and not if Confucius says it? <laughs> okay, so um, if you feel more of a, of a foreclosed guardian, I do want you to explain to me how you expanded your mind in some way, right? How about a searcher? Are you in the midst of a critical examination of potential alternatives, right? You don't have to make commitments, but you're engaged. And then the path maker, right? So you've, you've made some commitments based on your examination. Um, and so, the, I mean, there's lots of reasons why I hesitate on these categories. So I would recommend you don't stuff yourself into a box. I don't like boxes anyway, but you might wanna say, there's certain things that I definitely see myself as a path maker on. And then there's other things that I really am still um, keeping an open mind about. And then there are other things, deliberation where, okay, if I'm a path maker, and again, I use this example, I want to fix the housing situation, especially for African-Americans, because it's been so awful. Like That's what I want to do with my career. And so that's my path. That's what I care about, blah, blah. But I have to spend my whole life, you know, critically examining, is this the best thing for me to do? What about this particular decision? Should I join, should I go to this uh, grad school or this grad school? Should I go to law school or social work? Should I just, you know? So it never really ends. And so those kind of categories, um, are just there to trigger you, to get you going. Um, then I talked about how Athens lost its democracy. And, you know, the main point there was it was very well organized. The organizers had great ideas. They set up these institutions. They set up trial by jury, an assembly of citizens that voted on public policy tragedy to flush out all those irrational emotions so you could make good judgments. The Olympics, a sound mind and sound body. Um, the, I mean, it goes on and on, you know that. So, and then you know the story of how they lost it. They corrupted everything. And so one example of the corruption was the religious leaders. And Euthyphro was a fundamentalist and an absolutist and Socrates was much more. Um, he read the 
the holy text not as literally true but as moral teachings and he got in trouble right he got killed partly for not believing in the city's gods and euthyphro you know people were conflicted about him but um socrates was the one that got killed so then i have news articles that say we have these same problems and 9-11, how we reacted to 9-11. So you can think about that. If you want to put that in your final paper, you know, that the corruption of religion and religious leadership is a problem in our country that might undermine our democracy. Then there's Plato's apology. Do you think Socrates was a good citizen? He thought he was the ideal citizen, and, and I think so too. And then Martin Luther King was pointing out that Socrates was always trying to get people to think critically. So if you want to compare Martin Luther King to Socrates and you want to talk about Black Lives Matter and um, the sense in which democracy is at stake here and things like that, that's great. Should, um, if people are unjustly accused, should they run away? Um, and those issues, you could have those in your final if you want. Then, then I had news articles. These questions still come up today. Then we had the Sermon on the Mount. If people want to write about, you know, that was something that means a lot. The Sermon on the Mount and following Jesus and making sure you're focusing on the virtues rather than the doctrine. So then we had Aristotle's virtues. That was a major theme in the class. Um, Let's see, and then, then we covered Tippett where it was the union of science, religion, and social science. So then we had the biology of the spirit where Mr. Newland talks about how he was depressed. His rigid upbringing in Judaism led him to obsessive thinking. He became an atheist, forget all that stuff. And then he realized actually religion is about spirituality and living, having a, a dream, right? Seeing yourself as a virtuous person, always moving forward, trying to help people flourish. And that's an idea, but it changes your biology. And it, it, that's, those are the kinds of ideas we're supposed to have in order to be physically healthy. Then there was McCullough talked about revenge. In some sense, revenge is natural, but in some sense, cooperation is natural. And so, in so much as revenge is an overreaction, it's natural, but it but it leads us to a, a deterioration or collapse of our culture because culture depends upon cooperation. Um, and then I did talk about Martin Luther King and um, the the basic principles in his speech, which are anyway you can go through that. Then the next one with Chippet was stress and depression and how there are, again, the union of religion or faith or, you know, your idea of flourishing that makes you vibrant, that makes you feel alive and how depression is physiological. When it gets to that point where it's physiological, then, you know, it just takes time. But it's not just a physiological problem, it can be a spiritual problem also. And then the stress one was also, um, it's not just, there is a physiology to stress, but the way to get out of it, you have to have a vision. You have to learn all those religions were techniques for coping with stress, but also keeping yourself, keeping your body, mind and spirit, right? Your idea of what you want to be moving forward, keeping them going. And that's usually associated with religion. Then the suffering part is uh, when you suffer, um, there's so many different causes and you have to acknowledge that. Some of those causes are just the human condition. Some of them are an unjust society. Some of them are you chose to live on a fault line <laughs> knowing there was going to be an earthquake. Don't blame God, right? And here's the thing where, 
you know, if God created a universe that's ordered and we are capable of understanding it, it's not God's fault if we deliberately destroy the natural world and start living with the consequences. You know, God doesn't really want to flood us out or have all these hurricanes. We did that to ourselves and nature is trying to heal herself. And I don't think God's real happy with it if you believe in a God. But it's when people start using God to justify not doing anything. That's where a philosopher says no, right? This is a philosophy class. <laughs> so you do have to realize how incredibly anti-intellectual that is and how um, much damage when you split religion from science, any kind of science, that's how, that's when people start massacring and doing all sorts of truly horrible things in the name of God, <laughs> destroying the earth, the life on earth. So I would, you know, as a philosopher, as a philosophy class, um, I think religion is, spirituality is over and above science. There's a science that says you have to be spiritual. And there's a science that says all there is is physical stuff, but that doesn't explain human beings very well. People, people are driven by their ideas, but when their ideas become anti-science and they won't listen to scientists in any way, that's malfunction, that's maladaptive also. Um, all right, let's see. Then we went into political life, right? Which is sort of the segue into political life. So when you split religion from reason, then you're not capable of thinking like a citizen. In order to think like a citizen in a democracy, you have to be governed by reason. And um, in order to fix the sewers, in order to, you know, fix the damage done by a hurricane or in order to vote on public policy issues, in order to know who to vote for. You've got to learn how to think like a citizen. You have to learn about, you know, learn to think in terms of public policy. And so I talked about managers and the students wrote about their coaches. And um, let's see, the education of a educated voter, the virtue of an, another really important article about our founders and how concerned they were and how the education you get at Lyon is exactly what they wanted, the, the best and the brightest to get that and then spread that into the educational system. Then we talked about women's rights and um, I connected the same patterns that caused people to, to resist women's equality were true for race and for non-binary sexuality. Then I talked about the United Nations. Then we went into that section on humanism, a lot of different kinds of humanism. So a major theme in this class and a major issue for a lot of you was um, if you are a Christian humanist, which do you prefer, the humanist or the Christian? And our founding fathers actually put the humanists first. That's why Confucius is okay. Confucius is even better in terms of meeting together in a virtue club, which is a training to be a good citizen, right? As opposed to going to church. Um, all right, and a lot of the churches, I mean, the, the Church of England, 85 of the people who signed the Declaration were Church of England, they did not separate reason and faith, but um, the Puritans, Presbyterian, had this view of human nature as absolutely awful and the chosen. That's not consistent with reason. Um, uh, nowadays, a lot of, I just can't tell for sure, but I, uh, I think, well, the Presbyterian church has broken off and the standard branch unites reason and faith. But anyway, so then you have the way humanism has changed from 1933 to 73 to 2000. And then there's some other more recent ones. Um, humanistic psychology, some people were interested in. Then we had Martin Luther King and Black Lives Matter and those underlying principles. We had the 
Black Humanist Alliance, so that there are definitely African Americans involved in the movement who identify more as humanists than as Christians. Um, the tradition itself, Martin Luther King is Christian humanist with an emphasis on humanists. There were people of every religious tradition and atheist, secular humanist involved in the civil rights movement and involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, let's see, then we did, um, I think that was more like uh, synthesizing. Oh, anti-humanist. So I gave you some flavor of where the problems are. And there's just a lot of anti-humanists in our society, a big chunk. So this is not, so it needs to be taken seriously. And if you all find articles that you would like to share with me, I would like to have a number of articles of people who are anti-humanist. And some of them are more raving than others. You know, there can be perfect uh, people who have their reasons, right? I think ultimately, I don't think I'll be convinced, but it is important to be fair to opposing points of view. Um, then we had um, Confucius, all right? So we finished up. I, I put on some posts about racism and about um, uh, sort of more right-wing Christianity and how it's moving into our legal system at this point. And then we started Confucius. So we talked about Confucius, the founders, the Analects, news articles, and basically the position is humanism, Confucian humanism with Aristotle's virtues in the background. Then we did Hindu, talked about the issue of creation, um, environmental stuff. These traditions would not advocate um, destroying the environment. Um, we talked about how um, colonialism, Western colonialism deliberately tried to destroy these cultures and they thought of themselves as just a way of life they didn't think of them hinduism as a religion it was just a way of life talked about personality differences um stress um, conversion experience turnaround so hinduism and women the environment gandhi art um so then we did buddhism buddhism and the Sermon on the Mount, Buddhism and science and religion. If the universe changed, if the scientists said it changed, he'd change Buddhism. So our founding fathers, the scientists uh, changed their view of the universe and our founders changed their view of religion, <laughs> their view of God. So um, yeah, the real, the leaders tended to unite reason and faith. Um, let's see, so Buddhism, uh, religion in the brain, Buddhism has been shown to be very effective for changing brain chemistry, for balancing you out internally. Buddhism and human rights um, is technically, it's very pro-human rights. Um, Buddhist meditation has been shown to be very effective. So Buddhism and women, the difference between Buddha and the virtues that he exercised and then what happened afterwards and how it wasn't originally sexist and it became sexist. Buddhism and the environment, Buddha and, Pro and the Proverbs, a student paper. Seeking Christian interiority, the emphasis was on the inner life, which would be more incorporating Buddhist techniques would make sense now in a Christian society. Um, and then I emphasized, or I discussed Buddhist art and how it fits the wisdom of the Buddha, the thatched roof, right? You have to have a good thatched roof and the river and crossings like a conversion experience. Anyway, I love, I love that. And then you can think about the place of the arts in, not just religion, but in culture, right, in general. Then we had Islam, Muhammad, Jesus, and Buddha, same virtues, 
creation issues, the same kind of different points of view as there is in Christianity. Uh, the Quran, the pros and cons, the way it can get used to justify extremism or humanism, and um, Islam on women, Islam um, in the news, the humanist Muslims versus extremists, and then Purda, the sexual segregation of women. I gave you the pros and cons. Terrorism, fundamentalism, fatalism. Um, the Southern Spain had a translation project where the Old Testament, New Testament were translated into Arabic. Arabic was the language of high culture. Um, there was this huge culture of toleration starting just a hundred years after Muhammad died. And it lasted uh, you know, pretty well. It still survived for 700 years till 1492. Um, anyway, so that's a great history. It's a great example of how history works, how people can try to be tolerant and how extremist people abuse the tradition. They can misquote, they can, you know, they do lots of things if they want to destroy a tolerant tradition. And again, this is going on in our country. We're not immune to this. Um, and then, I did uh, Indonesia and the way that it tries to link the religion's belief in God with democracy. And so the reading for today has um, the way science and religion fit together. And um, so let me start out with just explaining um, Einstein's life, right? So I used to teach that in my wit class and the story of his life is a classic tragedy and he knows it too. So this is the story of his life. And this, and the reason I wanna tell this story is because it shows the way a personal story, a social story, a political story, a historical story, and a science story, a physicist story about the nature of the universe, right? How they all fit together. And every one of you has a personal story, a social story. You're stepping into history at a certain time and you need to know what's going on because your life is gonna be affected by it. And Einstein, okay, so he was Jewish, but he was, he grew up in Bern, Switzerland during the Enlightenment. This was before World War I. Everybody believed in the Enlightenment. Multiculturally went to a Catholic school. Like, who cares? A Jewish kid in a Catholic school doesn't matter. It was interfaith, it was progressive, science gonna save the world, blah, 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 blah. He didn't have any reason not to think that either, right? Everybody thought that. His third grade teacher called him a dunce, incidentally, but <laughs> not because he was Jewish. Um, I guess when he was nine years old, he got a compass and it just fascinated him. And he just started thinking about what's out there, you know, that's not material, that's moving this needle on this compass. And so he just, his mind just started floating away into the universe. He said he imagined uh, riding the light wave and stuff like that. <laughs> so he didn't pay a lot of attention in class. I, whenever any of you doesn't pay attention, you could say, well, I'm just having an Einstein moment, right? I'm a genius. I can't pay attention. But um, all right. So he grew up under those conditions. And then, um, of course, World War I was a shocker, right? And be, all of a sudden, all this wonderful enlightenment science had been used to create more destructive weapons of war than ever before. Um, but the main thing here was in World War II. So he was in Germany. And um, again, it was just, there was a Treaty of Versailles and the Jews were made to be, no, the Germans were made to be desperate. 
So then Hitler started rising up and blaming the Jews, right? They're going to blame the Jews for this problem. They don't blame themselves. Hey, guys. And um, they confiscated the Jews' wealth. The Jews, of course, were the bankers because the Bible says you're not supposed to loan money. You know, you're not supposed to charge people for money, usury. That's evil and wicked. So the Jews did it, the Christians didn't. So of course, when uh, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, which was not signed by Jews, <laughs> they never would have done that. It was very punitive. And so the Germans became destitute. So of course, right? Those Jews, they made all this money off of the war. You know, they're not one of us, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So obviously Einstein would think, well, what happened? You know, I was growing up, everything was going to be great, but at least he got out of there, right? There were plenty of Jews that just could not believe what actually happened, but he got out, he gets to America. He himself is a pacifist, right? I hate war. He writes, he has really nice letters. I hate war, um, but he got out of there. And then because of his discoveries when he was 20, 22 years old, it was because of his, the change in the worldview that the nuclear bomb was created because you had to have that different paradigm. So he was asked to join the Manhattan Project and to help in the creation of the bomb. Well, you know, the question was, if we don't do it, the Germans are gonna get it because the Germans are really smart. They were technocrats. They were extremely intelligent in science and technology. So this is more evidence that, yeah, science is not gonna save us. But anyway, so Einstein did join that and he was part of the project to create the bomb. So, that's a tragic story, right? And he knows it. He knows the scientists had good intentions and it all went south. <laughs> so um, I do want you to keep that in mind. Like good intentions are not good enough. You have to think through things constantly. Um, they're the start. You have to want, you know, to think through things, but you will make lots of mistakes for lots of reasons. Some of them you just didn't know. And then some of them you have a character flaw and you just got too angry. Some of them blah, blah. I mean, you just have to work that out. But anyway, so this is just about the universe, right? And so the nature of the universe is such that having these virtues, classical virtues makes sense. All this other stuff about culture, about needing to integrate pleasure and fear into culture and integrate culture into nature. All of that is reinforced, is legitimated, legitimized by what's, what's going on in physics. So, um, so this idea of we know enough about the universe, to be in awe of it, and also to know that there's a structure there, even if we don't understand all of it. So that's why it's possible for us to see patterns in human affairs, even though we don't know all of it, and it's imprecise. We know enough to know that it's wrong just to say, oh, God's will, or, oh, it's all absurd, or oh, it's a meaningless, or blah, blah. No, that anyone who says they're an atheist because life is meaningless and I can do what I want is, you know, I completely disagree with just like anyone who says it's all God's will and I can't do anything, God will do it. Those two extremes to me, to any philosopher should be absolutely out of bounds because it's clear that we can understand things because they're at least partially understandable. That's how we've gotten to the place we have. Um, so that's, um, uh, Einstein used to call it the cosmic religious feeling. So it was a feeling for him as well as, right? He was his reason and his faith are united. Um, what would you call that? Do you really need a label for it? 
do you want your worldview to have a label? So when you're writing your worldview, you can label yourself because you think it really helps focus what you really have come to at this point, or do you not want a label? At one point in one uh, class, I used to make the students label themselves something that looked like a contradiction, right? <laughs> like, um, oh, what was the country? Oh, um, an atheist humanist sorority girl or something like that, right? <laughs> and then they had to explain that. But in this one, you know, you can label yourself something or you can say, uh, box what box i don't see a box right you can i don't want a label there's no boxes there's no labels there's just life um okay so interview with freeman dyson we have a natural longing to understand well yeah they don't know though they don't realize that that's aristotle and that the whole his greek culture is completely structured around that they don't know that and I just, I just think it's sad. <laughs> it's also frustrating because, uh, you know, I'm so marginalized in the profession and I don't care personally. I care that this Greek culture that is trying to educate you, the whole person based on this desire to understand that that culture has been shredded and misinterpreted. That's what really bothers me. Um, okay, so you should approach science with religious awe. So here's something you might want to think about, and you might even want this to be the theme of your paper. Science without religion is lame, right? You can do the Holocaust if you have science without religion. Religion without science is blind, right? It might be well-intentioned, but it's blind. And it's going to do the same amount of destruction as science without religion, because the scientists then can just call it religion. <laughs> and, right? That's what Hitler did, right? God wants us to kill the Jews. So, yes, I say, eh, eh, no, that's where I draw the line. Um, nature finds all these extraordinary complex structures, which have, well, I don't, I don't know if nature, I, it's just this process, I guess, nature being this force toward higher and higher levels of complexity, and it, and it finds a slot to go in that follows a pattern. Um, all right, so organized complexity, black holes, so people were using, you know, black holes, as, yeah, it's all absurd. But, but this guy says, no, no, you can study black holes. It's the, the universe is more complex than Newtonian physics, but that's our fault, right? That's not the universe's fault. We can still find patterns. We just we have to look at the universe. We have to see it for what it is and then figure out the patterns from there. We have to change our science to fit the universe, uh, but we don't have to not. We're always seeking the pattern and we always find something because it's by nature intelligible. If it weren't, we never would have evolved and we wouldn't have been successful. Like the reason we're here and we're successful is because, yeah, we've been able to figure out the patterns. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so they're saying the Newtonian view was an intellectual straitjacket. Before that, ancient cultures thought of time as organic. And that's the way Einstein thinks of it, which I knew in, in high school, I mean, college. So the Aristotle would say the universe is bounded but unlimited. So it just keeps expanding, right? To higher and higher levels of complexity, higher and higher levels of good, higher and higher levels of being. Um, and so Aristotle also said that before there was any physical stuff, there was no time or space because time is the measure of motion and it's physical things that are in motion. And space is the, is the, you know, the movement of physical things over time, right? 
So the physical things define the space and define the time. So time and space emerged when the physical um, universe emerged, but that's not what Newtonian physics is based on. It's based on absolute space and time. Um, so Einstein restored it back to where it had been before, which I think is really interesting. Um, okay. Ah, yes, he understood the value of um, the, the, the traditional virtues. He understood the value of this model of wisdom. Um, okay. Okay. So Davy says the same thing. The universe is beautiful, fit for life. If the laws of physics hadn't been pretty close to what they were. So Davies actually really thinks there was this divine mind that sort of set things up. So he says if the universe was one quarter of a degree hotter, everything would have burned up. If it was one quarter of a degree colder, it would have frozen. Okay, what do we do with that? So Dyson, Davies tends to think there were, there's a divine mind. And other people just think, well, that's just the way being is, that it's constantly self-correcting and, and self-sustaining, right? But it doesn't really matter, I don't think, because our purpose in life is still to understand it. Our purpose is also for ourselves to constantly be seeking higher and higher levels of all those virtues, intellectual, moral, political, because that's where we're imitating the universe, you know? So either that's what God wants us to do, or that's what evolution requires that we do, or whatever you want to say, right? Um, remember the guy on revenge said, revenge is natural, but it's destructive of culture, and cooperation is also natural, and we actually do it a lot more often, and it's, it, develops culture. So a lot of that wisdom literature, the tragedies here, you're going to want to take revenge. Here's what happens. Don't do it. Move on. Find something creative. Um, okay. Uh, we have emerged. That's very Aristotelian, very Greek. Um, there, the universe is, is about something, right? All we know is that we're supposed to understand it and live in harmony with it, right? So every major religious tradition emphasize, emphasizes integration of nature and culture, not it, it uh, criticizes pride and greed. And uh, yeah, we're just not paying attention. Um, uh, this is another good point that the Genesis stories, most of those stories from religions are intended to be poetry because they're intended to appeal to your emotions and your imagination. They're not intended to be scientific texts based on facts. If at that time, the people who wrote them, if you just wrote down facts, you were a scribe, you're not an intellectual. You're just somebody with sensations and you can observe something, write it down. That's not the the paradigm of wisdom or truth. If you're wise, you can look at all this data and find the pattern and the meaning that lasts over time, right? There will be new facts, but the patterns will stay. That's wisdom. And myth, by definition, was about patterns. And of course, in the modern era, it got totally demonized. Myth means false <laughs> because it's not a fact. Fact, true. Myth, false. Not fact, false. That is just really a mistake. It really prevents us from understanding what religions have to offer. Um, he advocates science and religion. He talks about the physical world. Uh, we need both the poets and the scientists Liberal arts education is education in arts and sciences. Um, prayer is not magic. You can, you know, that's what he thinks it is. It's actually interaction. You can articulate your vision through prayer. 
It changes your body chemistry, changes your behavior. You literally create a history. So, but you know, you can pray and ignore climate change and it creates a bad history. You can pray and really get committed to integrating culture and nature and it creates a different history. So um, yeah, you just have to be careful about making God into yourself, into a function of your own ego. What God wants just happens to be what I want. You have to be really careful about that. Um, illness is affected by our personality. We have agency. We have the power. Definitely wisdom traditions are like that. Um, there, are, there are things where novelty occurs. And there are things that don't change. Law of gravity. <laughs> you know, there's certain forces in the universe we cannot change. There's other things that we can change. Um, okay. The problem of evil and suffering. Here's another way to understand it. And that can go back to Seneca. Tectonic plates, right? So the world unfolds as a result of genetic mutation. That doesn't mean there's no God. It's the way God set things up. But it's open to the possibility of malignant malignancies, which includes cancer. Doesn't mean God caused cancer, right? Um, evolution led to the capacity for sight. Some people are born blind. That doesn't mean God made them blind. <laughs> It's just, here's the healthy way of functioning. Every step of the way, there's the possibility of malfunctioning. Um, tectonic plates are necessary for life, but when they slip, there's a tsunami or an earthquake. Well, if you happen to live on the fault line, like in San Diego, it's not God's fault, and it doesn't make the world a worse place. It just means you, human beings, in this case, defiantly live where they know there's going to be an earthquake. In other places, people lived without having any idea. But that doesn't mean God is mal malicious. And, you know, may God didn't cause that. God caused the, the earth to be the way it is, to flourish, to promote life. Human beings are part of that process. But it's an accident where they happen to live where there's an earthquake, if they didn't know. It's arrogance, as it is in Southern California. Okay, God respects the integrity. He's not going to change anything to save some human life. Um, okay. All right. So then there's that. And then the article on Janet Levin is that she has a lot of the same things. She loves the, um, the order of things. Um, I think her view of determinism is interesting. Um, I disagree with it and I, it doesn't make any sense internally. Like if she thinks, see determinism, it's just an ambiguous thing. I think people, nobody really believes it. So she clings to her love of her children and her hopes and dreams for her children, right? In the face of determinism. Well, you could say, well, I was determined, right? Because I have this instinctual love for my children and that's built into our nature. Well, but when my children were born, I had an instinctual love for them and I, and I, you know, I have hopes and dreams for them, but I realize that other mothers love their children just as much. So it's that much more important that we have taxes and we have good public schools and good parks and good this and good that. So every child can get what they need, right? So, so now is that determinism, you know? One mother can say, yeah, I love them. That's why we have to have more social programs, not socialism. We have to have um, taxing the rich, setting up 
uh, a good public policy to have a good middle class. Another mother has kids and said, I don't care. Any, I don't care about anybody else's kids. I care about my kids. I'm putting private school. I'm going to avoid taxes. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. Is that determinist? See, <laughs> like determinism explains everything and nothing. Um, so it's a matter of choice how you deal with your instincts, right? The same thing that Mr. McCullough said about, about when Bud um, Welch's daughter was killed in the, in the Oklahoma bomb, right? You still have a choice and you do have instinctual reactions. So determinism doesn't explain. There is a realm of human choice. You can't, I think it would be very odd for a mother not to love her kid, although human beings are capable of incredible <laughs> corruption, but that's not natural. It's just that culture is what we choose to do in developing from our instinctual drives into culture. And she doesn't seem to get that at all. And it, it is, it's surprising people get over-educated and over-specialized so that they don't even really know what they're saying. <laughs> and she's not the only one. I mean, they're all, they're all like that. Um, okay. So she, mathematical truths are absolutely true. And so that's a difference between math and for example, um, ecological uh, biology, right? Um, when you're studying an ecosystem, it's not like math, right? It isn't as absolutely cut and dried. You can't predict exactly because everything interacts with everything to create this huge biosphere. In math, it isn't like that. Um, but again, she says, it's amazing, we can understand it. She has a sense of meaning, purpose, and beauty, right? Um, time is relative and curved, exactly what Aristotle said. <laughs> um, human culture, right? Um, okay, so our intuitions are based on our mind. Um, she says this, I also think is, she says things completely constructed by human beings are uninteresting to her, such as legal systems um, and aspects of life based on animalistic instincts because they're small minded. Well, the answer to that, which I, again, I think she writes it off too quickly, is that they're, they're not uninteresting, they're important. And if she has kids, she should think they're important. Because if she wants her kids to flourish, she needs a good legal system, a good educational system. And those are constructed, but they're not arbitrary, right? There's better or worse constructions based on the criteria. Do they help her children and everybody else flourish? So that, that's disappointing, but it's a good example of how especially PhDs, people trained in a certain way, they really lose sight of the big picture. And again, undergraduate liberal arts education, you're supposed to graduate with a pretty sophisticated holistic view, but then you go get a job or go to grad school and you start to specialize. But you do need this, um, uh, you do need to understand that they all get integrated and that every aspect of your life comes within a context. So I, I did give you a number of these things in terms of the historical moment and um, what I, I mean, what I worry about, but I'm a philosopher. I would naturally worry about these things. Um, and they also fit, you know, certain themes that we've had in the class. So that's plenty long. And um, I'm sorry for taking all your time, but I do look forward to this. And I appreciate all of you who have taken the time. I've watched you grow even in the short time we've had together. <laughs>
And uh, I am sorry about the students who couldn't keep up. I don't know how someone who works 40 hours a week can also basically the class was requiring about technically about 35 hours a week. Because if it's two and a half hours and you're supposed to do two hours per hour of class, that would be 35 hours. And I, you know, I didn't, I don't think it would take that long to do my assignments, but I think it would take at least two thirds of that, which again is a lot of hours a day. So I completely am happy to sign incompletes. I haven't gotten any yet and I worry about it or somehow being able to withdraw without an F. Because otherwise I'm gonna to have to fill out those forms on Thursday with a lot of Fs and I really do not wanna do that. So please contact me. Um, thank you.